<laughs> hey everyone, we're back for session number three today. This has been a jam-packed day and I'm thrilled to be here with the incredibly talented Debbie Sementelli and Laura Worthington. Welcome guys. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Of yeah. course. Our pleasure. Thanks for being here. So um, this is going to be a little bit different from the other sessions we've had. We're getting pretty technical today, but we're going to learn a whole lot when it comes to how to create a font. We're going to learn the technical aspects. We're going to learn the lettering aspects, how to pull it all together. And I couldn't think of two better equipped people to talk about this because in my mind, you guys are like the dream team of font making. <laughs> I love how collaborative you are with your process and you're both very, very experienced. So I think everyone tuned in live Notepads at the ready, as always. This is going to be a really, really value packed session. We hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thank you. Laura, I think you're going to kick us off, right? Yeah. So, a little Let's do this. overview. Um, so, I'm going to try and keep this to five minutes. Yeah, good luck with that because um, <laughs> talk a lot. <laughs> Big shock there. Um, but I'm just basically going to go through and give everybody um, kind of like a, a brief, like five minute whirlwind tour of what goes into designing a typeface. So here we go. You guys get to see my little keynote presentation I put together for this. Love it. All right. And just while Laura's bringing that up, um, as I say, both very, very experienced. Laura, you've released how many fonts? Do you even know over the a years? Over a little over 200. Lot. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know, it's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as you're going to see, as uh, Laura starts sharing, we're, we're going to link up Laura's store in the DC marketplace. You're going to see there's some very big fonts. You may or may not have realized it was Laura behind them with some of them, but there are some huge names here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorite fonts for sure. Yeah, definitely. Can you see my screen? Uh, I can't currently, actually. Let's see. It might be the uh, the icon at the top. Don't worry, though. This there is we the, go. I got this it. This is the beauty of live. Okay. Don't worry, guys. We get that. <laughs> all right. All right. You guys see the inspiration? We do. Perfect. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, it's a question I get quite often, and this is always what starts out a typeface design, right, is your inspiration. You know, you have to start out with, you know, what is the reason for designing this typeface to begin with? And I've got, gotten this question so many times, and I've been able to kind of boil it down the answer to three different things for me particularly. So my inspiration comes from uh, what I see in the world. So for example, I could be you know driving down the road and see a sign or a poster, uh, be in the grocery store and see some packaging and you know just look at something and go, oh, that's a really great idea. Um, I snap pictures of things all the time. In fact, I keep a little um, photo library. Um, I think I have a little over 7,000 images that I keep track of, of just things that are inspiring to me. Um, so also inspiration for me comes from just simply sketching and lettering, lettering experiments. So, you know, I'll take out a brush or a pointed pen and I'll just, you know, um, sit down and do some lettering. And I might be inspired by a letter I see or a word I come up with. And that may end up being the beginning of a new typeface design. Sometimes the ideas or the inspiration just simply comes from ideas of what I think could be useful. So I could, you know, think to myself, um, you know, one day kind of just, you know, meandering thoughts of, you know, it would really be great if um, we had more fonts out there that were, you know, like really bold fat scripts and maybe I should design something like that. So those are kind of my three, three main sources of inspiration and that's how any typeface gets started. But after you have your inspiration and your idea, you have to start to develop your concept. And for me, that includes a little bit of research, you know, kind of seeing what, you know, how the spot may be used, what other people have done, you know, along the same lines, you know, if it's if it's a typeface that, you know, maybe has some um, rooting in history um, and, you know, start to kind of really develop my ideas. Um, I also think it's really important to define your audience and set the parameters for your design. So really thinking about who is going to be using this typeface. And when I say who, I'm not just talking about the person who's going to be purchasing the license, but also who as in the end user, who is going to be seeing this when this typeface ultimately makes its way out into the public. So it's going to be designed for, it's typeface for packaging. You know, who is going to be seeing this and how are they gonna to react to it in say a grocery store setting? Um, what are they gonna be using it for? You know, what, um, what purpose is this screen, is this print? Um, and where are they going to be using it? You know, um, and, uh, well, um, what's the purpose of it? Um, and um, 
also how, you know, how are they going to be using it? What features are they going to be using? You know, what are, what are the things that they're going to be doing with this typeface? And uh, how are they, you know, going to need to use it? What are you going to need to include? So that is the next part. So after you've got your concept together and you've almost kind of written a bit of a creative brief, which I think is a really good idea, you know, kind of going back to this idea of concept. Um, something that I like to do is actually journal and write about what I'm planning on creating. And, you know, that helps me sort of channel my thoughts into, um, you know, what I'm actually going to be developing and, you know, be really kind of thinking about it in a thoughtful way. Otherwise, I have all these ambiguous thoughts that are just sort of floating in the ether. Um, so anyhow, I get to the creative part, which is always the best. So I start <laughs> with sketches, hand lettering, you know, that's going to be used for the typeface. And, you know, really kind of just, you know, exploring and seeing all the options and setting the basis for the outlines that I'm going to be drawing from it. So I like to actually take photos uh, with my iPhone or scan in my sketches or my lettering. And I use that um, to draw my outlines directly over the top of that lettering. So um, I've, I know there's some people in type design who can actually look at a blank screen and take the pen tool and start drawing outlines of a letter. I totally can't do that. Um, you know, a lot of props to them, but <laughs> for me, I need to actually like have the lettering or the sketch, you know, um, inside of the font design program I'm using and drawing the outlines over the top of it. I'm very literal about these things. So once I've got all of my, my outlines in there, you know, my vector outlines, um, and by the way, I usually just start with the lowercase alphabet and get that really kind of worked out and then bring in some of the other stuff. I find that we use 95% 90, of the uh, characters that end up being used um, in typesetting are the lowercase letters. And so you really want to kind of get all of those things resolved first, because sometimes as you move through that, it can make enough changes. You know, you've made enough changes that it can affect some of the other things that you've drawn to go with it, such as your uppercase letters, numerals, punctuation. And you may actually need to change some of those things to adapt to you know, the, the revisions that you've made along the way with the lowercase. Um, so I kind of start out with like one block of characters at a time and work my way out from that. So I usually go lowercase, uppercase, numerals, punctuation, and kind of move out from there. Um, so once I've kind of done like a rough pass of my, you know, basic um, alphabet, I like to print it out and just simply review it. And I like to look at it and just say, you know, does everything play well together? Type is a system. You know, we have to be thinking about it in terms of um, almost, you know, like how things work together in harmony. And, um, you know, does it have the appropriate rhythm? You know, do they, you know, are there any characters that stand out too much and, and garner too much attention? Um, you know, what, what are the things that I need to go back and change? And sometimes, I would say about a third of the time, um, I'll start a typeface and I end up scrapping it and going back to the drawing board and starting over again with drawing new, you know, new lettering, because I realized upon review that, you know, there's just some real critical things that just were not working. So, you know, I'll go through and make some revisions. And um, I like to talk about the difference between revising and refining. So revising is, um, you know, making like significant changes, you know, you're, you know, you're really changing things stylistically and refining is really kind of dialing into these really micro details and making those letters as perfect as possible. And again, it's all about the details when it comes to refinement. After I do that, I test it. And you're gonna see the screen come up quite a bit because testing of your typeface is so critical every step of the way. Print it out, view it on screen. Um, you know, I like to do things like uh, do little printouts and then um, you can find them around my house. Um, sometimes in my car when I'm, you know, waiting at a red light, I'll pull up my little paper and go, oh, man, that R looks like crap. I'm going to start over again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, kind of looking at it in like different lights and different settings, um, you know, trying things, testing at different sizes, um, you know, really just kind of putting your font to, to the test and seeing how it looks. Uh, sometimes people forget that. So important to remember. And then after I've kind of decided, you know, like I, I have my lowercase and uppercase alphabet and, you know, everything's looking pretty good. I'll go about completing the rest of the typeface. So I'll bring in, um, you know, drop the remaining glyph set. So, you know, I'll get into the numerals, the punctuation, symbols, diacritics or accents, um, you know, my alternates and swashes and, you know, anything else that I may have involved in there. And I just kind of bring everything all together. And then again, I test it and I take a look and see how everything is working together. Um, I like to, you know, use kind of my um, 
squinto vision and sort of make sure that everything is coloring well. And by that, I mean, um, you know, you're looking at a screen of text and you are making sure that um, it looks, you know, the, the, the page itself looks pretty even. You know, you don't have any dark areas in your type or, or areas that are too light. Just sort of seeing how everything looks together in context and making sure, especially when you get into things like symbols and, um, you know, other characters that are a little bit more unusual, that they're fitting into the overall style of the alpha numeric part of the typeface. So next, I'll go in and start really working on my spacing. Um, so spacing and kerning are two different things. Uh, spacing is setting the, it's setting the default or kind of um, standard amount of space for each glyph. And it's something that once a font is published, um, it can't be changed unless you actually go in, back into the font software and do that. So spacing around a letter is, is set and it's fixed, it's, it's finite. Um, kerning, on the other hand, is something that is changing. It changes between two glyphs. So, you know, the amount of, you know, space between them is independent and unique to a particular pair. So, for example, the AR may have its own, you know, like kerning pair, which is quite different than spacing, which, you know, the A has a, a, a set amount of space around it on the right and left, regardless of what letter comes before or after it. So spacing is really, really challenging to learn. Um, and it's, it's one of the most important things that you can learn how to do. And I really suggest um, reading up on it if you're new to spacing. There's a lot of theories and a lot of, um, a lot of methods and uh, just information about out there about how to do it. Um, but take your time with it for sure. Learn how to do it because it's very important and of course, test it. <laughs> I can see the coming. Oh yeah, exactly. And, and test your spacing. Um, but it's very important to get that spacing right because you don't want to try to bail yourself out with kerning. Um, so kerning sometimes it can be a little bit of a crutch. It can be kind of one of these things where you're, you know, you don't have your spacing quite right, and so you end up adding all these kerning pairs to try to fix poor spacing. The problem with that is that kerning is a feature. And features can be activated or deactivated. And there's quite a few programs out there still to this day that do not have kerning on by default, like <clears throat> Microsoft Word um, <laughs> is one of them. And that's a, that's a real problem because if your spacing is not done well and you're relying on kerning to make the font look good and the kerning is off by default, guess what happens? You know, your typeface looks, you know, kind of crappy. So you want to make sure that you... Um, you know, do your spacing right. Um, and here's another interesting little note about spacing. Um, in an all connected script face, in the lower case, if all the letters connect to each other, you should be able to get it to a point where you actually don't require any kerning pairs whatsoever in the lower case in a fully connected script. So uh, that was something I learned kind of early on. I, I found myself making the same kerning pair of mistakes, you know, over and over again and realized that all I need to do is just adjust my spacing, fix I, my kerning. I didn't know that. That is good to know though. Yeah, yeah. It's like I said, it's, it's a really tricky thing. Um, but, you know, you also think about spacing as, um, you know, it's the white area around the letters. And that's what defines how the letter looks. Um, it's not just the black of the letter. It's also the white of the letter, so to speak. Um, so that spacing is critical. So, for example, if you have a, a typeface spaced really widely and um, you want it to look, you know, it's going, going to actually look um, less bold, for example. So if you, if you want a typeface to look more bold, you tighten up the spacing, right? It'll, you know, the closer those black letters are together, you know, the, the darker it's going to look. So it has a lot of impact on, um, you know, the overall coloring of the typeface and how it's, how it's set properly. Um, and then of course, after you've done your kerning, which by the way, save kerning until the very end. It's fine to do kind of a rough passive kerning in the beginning, but it's a big mistake that a lot of people make early on is by going through and spending all this time on kerning before they've worked out a lot of other details. Then you have to go back and strip your kerning out and start over again. So save it towards the end. It's very hard to sometimes to, you know, like have that, um, you know, self-control. It's like you just want to <laughs> start kerning. It's also a little bit of a, um, it's kind of this fun little neurotic thing that you can do a little, you know, people with OCD love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, skin test. And then after that, we go into features. And so, um, and with features, you know, I'm talking about open type features, obviously, and there's just no shortage of what you can do with them. Um, there's just a lot of possibilities, you know, within um, open type. Uh, so you want to define them, you know, by looking at your type 
ligature, we have, you know, contextual alternates, swashes, stylistic sets, um, all of these different pieces and parts, you know, so what are they? Let's define them first. There is a four letter code for all open type features. If you just simply Google, you know, open type features, um, you know, you'll find a great Wikipedia page on that that will tell you um, that C-A-L-T stands for contextual alternates. And that if you add that to your open type class, you know, your open type feature panel, um, that will start to set the page, you know, the, the tone for getting in your contextual alternates. Um, so you want to build them out, you know, basically say, you know, like these are our features and this is what is included in, you know, stylistic set 03, substitute A by A.01, whatever you name it. And then, of course, you want to test it and make sure those things actually work and function the way that you expect them to. So, again, test. <laughs> And then, <laughs> and Laura, Laura, I feel like your fonts are particularly known for all of these extra features and open type flourishes and everything you could possibly imagine. You really over deliver with that. And for <laughs> everyone watching live, if you click on click on the green button below this live stream, and it will take you to Laura's shop. Have a explore later because you will be staggered at how much Laura does this and how much it adds to the character of the font. And you'll see it with these classic fonts she's made, like Adorn and Charcuterie. Like it's just incredible work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I really, I think with um, the features and all the things that are added in, what really motivated me to do that out of the gates was um, that I really wanted to put, you know, designers that the users of the typeface in the in the um, driver's seat. I wanted to give them you know, some creative, you know, uh, freedom and control over the typeface other than just merely typesetting it. You know, it's one thing, you know, you just, you type it up and you go like, that's, that's kind of it. And that's, you know, sort of a limited involvement in the typeface, but how do you make a typeface look really custom in a design setting and a layout? You do that by giving people these choices, you know, by giving them swashes and ligatures and all different kinds of things that they can turn around and take the typeface that you've designed and make it look very custom and very bespoke. And I think um, people really love that. You know, they, they really want to do a little bit more with type other than just type, ha ha. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the final step, um, <clears throat> yay, is publishing. Yay, so we get to this last part. So you get to name it what you wanna name it. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for um, figuring out uh, different names, you know, like if, if a name is taken, um, and I do have a link um, on, uh, I think that Raluca is going to share here pretty soon um, to uh, some articles that are on my website uh, that are for typeface design, lettering design, and typography. Uh, the link in particular is sharing uh, for typeface design. And in that, I have um, different little areas that you can, you know, take a look at. But there's a couple sites that will help you, you know, figure out like, okay, is this name taken or not? Um, mm -hmm. Pricing. You got to, you know, get a price it yourself, you know, figure out, you know, how much you want to charge for this typeface. Write up your description, you know, make sure that it's more than just, you know, kind of explaining the, uh, you know, the cool parts of it, but, you know, really kind of telling people, you know, how they can use it, um, you know, what the purpose of it, what the purpose and what's included in it and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Got to get together all of your marketing collateral. So, you know, your, your images, your user guide, if you do that, um, you know, anything that is going to help, um, you know, people kind of understand what's included in that typeface, how they could use it, you know, giving them ideas. Um, and of course, developing a social media plan so that when you publish it, uh, people know about it and they can go and purchase it. So it's, that's it's a whole lot of work, isn't it? And we've done several collaborative fonts now and it's really given us that insight into how much work goes into creating a truly robust, stunning font. And it's a lot. It really is. You have to love the process, I think, to uh, be a font designer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it uh, full time for 10 years now. It's um yeah. Oh my gosh. Veteran in the phone world. I, I, love should that. Have a, I should have a birthday too, like a typeface design birthday. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> um, that was great. Thank you so much. That's such yeah. a, a great overview to get us started. And I believe Debbie, you're now going to show us the uh, lettering side of how you can start creating a font. Absolutely. Awesome. Please take it away. I am. Okay. I, I love this. It's like um, back and forth between you guys showing the full process. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. First of all, Laura is an incredible uh, human being and font designer, and she Aww. has taught me everything I know. So I just want to point out that um, 
pay attention to all these details that she's telling you because uh, she really knows her stuff. So um, look at this. I completely agree. And um, look at this amazing graphic as well that Debbie's made. Okay, so I that. know she totally showed me up. <laughs> no, 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 you'll see as we go through. But we just did want to wish you a happy sixth birthday. Uh, you've done incredible work for um, all of the people that love design cuts. You're constantly giving valuable products and information. And so we celebrate with you and we thank you for having us. It's incredibly and sweet. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Uh, so this is Laura and I. We are typeface designers and we also teach brush lettering. And I want to just point out something. People call uh, use the word fonts. Um, and there's actually two different things that we're talking about. Typeface is the style of the font. It's, it's the look of it. Um, the font is the actual physical thing that's on your computer that you download and then install. So just a little bit of type geek stuff. Um, <laughs> but we all know that everybody now just refers to typefaces as fonts, so we're cool with that. Um, but we do also teach uh, brush lettering, and we both came from those backgrounds. So um, it's kind of, you know, our first love. Al um, Laura also, of course, was a graphic designer as well, so she has much more experience on that level. But um, we have been lucky to uh, be teaching for Adobe Max for the last five years. And we'll be there again in Los Angeles from November 4th through 6th. So we have three workshops that we'll be doing there just for anyone who's going. Uh, we hope that you will come in and join us for our class. Um, also, a little bit that some people don't know, we also have experience feeding <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. This is when we were in San Diego when Adobe Max was there, and we took this incredible safari, like behind the scenes, and got to feed a lot of wild animals. So, <laughs> if the plant making doesn't work out in the future, we've got some other plans. <laughs> but today we're talking about how to create a font from scratch. And before you grab some pen, ink, and paper, or an iPad and pencil, oops, sorry, I didn't do that, and start lettering, uh, I'm going to refer to what Laura talked about. First, you need to know who is your customer, what are their needs and wants, and how might the font be used. So she touched on that, and I'm going to show you an example of one of my customers. So I really focus a lot on invitation design because it's probably my first love because as a calligrapher and brush lettering artist, I worked a lot with wedding planners. And um, so it's something I know and love. So this comes to us from a lovely designer named Victoria York. And um, she took this font that I'm currently working on and she's helping to, she's one of my testers and she put it into an invitation suite. So what the what the uh, who, what, and how is demonstrated here. So I am concentrating on invitation designers. So I look at what do they need. So they need, as Laura referred to, a lot of choices. So I might, as Laura also does, I might have eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 alternates for one lowercase letter. I know that the current trend is to use lowercase for a lot of these types of details like the rehearsal dinner, the detail card, the RSVP. So I'm paying particular attention to those letters and making sure that I give the designers what they're looking for, what they want, so that they can create these incredible designs. So this is just a more specific example of when you're looking at whoever your customer is, what are their needs, and how will they use it. And that is something that you need to think about before you even start to create the font. I love that. So it's exactly the same as what we've discussed in some of the sessions so far this week. It's no mm -hmm. different than doing a client project. 
-hmm. even if you're doing a pro uh, product that is going to be scalable and bought by lots of people, hopefully, you should still go through the same kind of process, the mood boards, really think about who you're trying to serve with it. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, just... Yeah, to... having those defined parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, <laughs> Sorry. you know, Laura Go already... <laughs> yeah, you, are, you did such a great job pointing that out. So I'm just being very specific to what my customer is and who my customer is. But, of course, we both have lots of different types of customers. Again, Laura being a graphic designer and coming from that background, she can create a font and think, if I were a graphic designer doing this particular project, what might I need or want? So we're looking at categories, markets for um, stationery and crafting, publishing, packaging, logos and branding, TV and film. And I've given a few examples. So this is Laura's font on some items. So you have the crafter that might make these um, cut out type of little cake um, sign, but they do them for birthdays and weddings, etc. Of course, invitations, of course, logos and packaging, games. Uh, she had one appear on a particular birthday beer <laughs> sign. I love that. Guys, can I ask, is there any better feeling than seeing your product used out in the wide world? It is the coolest feeling in the world. I always say it's kind of like when you see your child in, you know, the class play and they're yeah. like, it's my kid. And <laughs> people are always amazed that like we can identify a letter. Like I can see a letter and go, oh, that's mine that came from this particular font because mm. you work for so long on them that they really become like your children. My, so, my, my friends are so used to me just being like, that's one of ours. That's one of ours in terms of stuff available in our marketplace. I see it everywhere. It's restaurant menus, it's shop fronts. Like yeah. when you get deep into the, the world of fonts, you really do notice it everywhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So here's some examples with my fonts. Of course, you see it on pillows and this is beauty products, more imitation, books, um, logos, mugs, cards. There's just so many products out there and ways that fonts are used. So you really have to get real specific about how you want to um, put a font out. You know, what, what market do you want to serve? And even though you're just serving that market, you'll find it used on a lot of different products, but you kind of have to really find that niche. And um, we talk about that a lot with, with Tom in, uh, in our little group. But um, anyway, so if you're ready to start, let's look at some of the tools that you might use. Traditionally, as I work traditionally, because my background is as a calligrapher and brush lettering artist. So those are the tools I'm most comfortable with. Those are the tools where I feel like I can put the life into the letters. And that's really important when you're trying to have your font have a feeling, have something that people can identify with it. So um, these are just some of the things that I might use, some of the papers. Tracing paper, um, this is a very nice uh, Claire Fontaine paper, Rodia, a lot of people know about Rodia. I was gonna say that looks fancy. <laughs> yeah. But you know what, you can even take, um, just like, you know, printer paper, literally, because it's not so much about the tools, it's about your hand. It's about kind of, you know, combining your head and your heart and letting that flow out through your hand. So you could have the perfect tools, but if you don't have something that you're trying to express, the font won't show any of that. So um, tools are great. It's wonderful when you can master the tools but it's really important to have it come from a combination of your head and, and heart and a true love for the letters and for what you're trying to create for the people that you're trying to create it for. So um, these are some of the uh, things that I use, ink, traditional nibs, that's just one nib that I use. Uh, Pentel color brush is what Laura and I use when we do our brush lettering courses. It's probably our favorite tool for <laughs> beginners especially who um, really want to play with a brush but don't want to uh, 
uh, kind of mess with the um, uh, the um, viscosity of the paint, um, how thick or how thin to make it, that can be kind of a pain. So the Pentel color brush is a really nice way to start doing something with a brush. Then we they, also, they are great. And I seem yeah. to recall that's what you very kindly gifted us when you visited Debbie. Debbie yeah. gave a, the whole Design Cuts team a live workshop in brush lettering and gave us each one of these brush pens, which I'd never used in my life, but was so lovely to work with. And yeah, they're a ton of fun. Yeah, they are a lot of fun. And um, and then you don't have to mess with, like I say, dipping in an in ink and that kind of thing. Yeah. Then you have your standard brush markers. And I always suggest that a beginner, very, very beginner, new to brush lettering, start with a brush marker first. You know, make it easy on yourself. Because again, it's never really about the tool. It's always about how you train your hand to create those beautiful flourishes, to have a fluidity, to, um, to make the marks that you want it to make. It all really starts with your hand. Um, so don't worry about the, um, the actual tool you're using. In fact, on my Instagram, I have um, in my uh, stories, I do a lot of the um, just using a pencil showing people how it's not about anything fancy. Just grab a piece of paper and some pencil, in fact, line paper, so you have some, some guidelines, and just start there. So don't be intimidated if you don't have what you think are you know, the right tools. It's not, never really about the tools. You can go contemporary and use an iPad and an Apple Pencil. Um, Laura has made some fonts using the iPad and I myself have not. I'm still kind of learning how to make that tool work for me because I'm so kind of um, traditional in, in terms of what I like to use because that's, that's what I've used for such a long time. But um, all of it works. So one of the things that Laura was talking about was determining the look or the mood or the feel. Are you going to make it upright or italic? Are you going to have high contrast in your thicks and thins? Is it going to be monoline? Again, talking about the spacing, is it going to be wide or tight? So all of these things have to be thought of before you ever put a pen to paper. And um, that's where you really are kind of forming the gel that will become, you know, the butterfly. Um, you're putting all those things together. And now you've got something internally that is driving you. And I think that's what shows up in your lettering. So some of the things that I think about when I'm creating the original design, and these are some pictures of pen and ink that I use for my current font, which is called Hello My Love. So again, because I'm always thinking of that end user, and in particular, an invitation designer, I know they're going to want flourished ending lowercase. I know they're gonna want possibly connected and semi-connected letters. I know they're gonna to wanna to see ligatures, not only the standard ligatures that are created so that you can eliminate collisions, but also ligatures that might be a little bit more adventurous and, and have a little bit more design to them. And they're going to want flourished caps because oftentimes the, if you're doing a wedding invitation, you want to have the names uh, stand out a little bit more. So when you give it a flourished cap for the bride and groom, or bride and bride or groom and groom's names, then it just adds a little bit more of the um, fancy. And this is just a uh, one uh, word that I, I write many different words many different times. I have like usually at least 50 sheets of writing that wow. I go through just to start to get the look of the feel the look and feel of the font. So again, it's like I'm taking all those things that I've been thinking about um, and I am trying to express that on paper. And it takes maybe the first 20 pages. I'm going, oh, there's a letter that has that feeling, but I got to keep going and keep going to kind of draw it out. 
But one of the things that I'm doing at the same time is I'm considering the possible collisions. So while I really like long uh, crosses when you have a T, this can create a problem in a font. You can't have that be a standard T because there's too many things that would co collide with it or any of the um, ascending letters are gonna collide with it. Similarly, whenever you have a lowercase descending letter, you've always gotta be careful about your standard letters not having collisions. Now, you can't avoid that um, totally, but you wanna try as much as possible. So here's an example of the original lettering for this word and then the solution in creating a ligature for these double L's that could, would keep this from um, colliding. So this is like two standard L's and you can see, I'd really have to change the spacing a lot in order to make those not collide. So hmm. instead I create a ligature that does that for me. And, so, and not just this, but we've noticed people love these ligatures because often these fonts are used to achieve a digital version of an organic analog hand drawn look. And right. if you have two letters that are identical, that breaks the entire illusion because it's clearly a digital font. Whereas it, when every letter is different via ligatures, it retains that hand drawn authentic look. Right. Which is why even though um, these do have the space between them, you can see that both of the L's are different. So that's exactly why we do that. Um, so then you can uh, notice that there are some very common ligatures that you're going to need to make no matter what, VR, WR, a lot of the V and Ws because of where they connect with letters. So you, you kind of get to know there's a whole kind of list that you get to know, I'm just going to need to make some ligatures for these because it's, it's impossible for them to connect perfectly with every single letter. Now, of course, the more experienced you get, the better you get at solving those problems. But in general, most, most of the time, there are some things that you're always going to have to create some um, ligatures for. So once you got most of the letter issue solved, it's time to scan it in and get it into the font program. So what we're really looking at, at is how do we go from here, all of our hand lettering all done, we've worked out all of these problems already to here, a font that actually works well together, doesn't have all those collisions. And this is where Laura is gonna take it from here and show you how once you get it into the computer, how you actually make the letters into glyphs. So Laura. Yeah. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing, Debbie. Hey, welcome. It, it's such an insight and I can testify having learned from you firsthand in person, you really are super experienced. You really know what you're doing. And I love that you bring that traditional element of lettering into the font world, to be honest, because not everything needs to be super clean and super digital and super modernized. I, I really love the character that your font work captures. Great, well, thanks. Okay, so now I'm, uh, I'm going back and I'm like, oh, where did I forget how to stop sharing? Okay. You got it? I'm there you go. It. Yeah, it's the little cross. Next one. Little cross, close. There you go. Yep, perfect. And so we should, Oh no, I think we've, we've actually lost uh, the main video. <laughs> Don't worry, okay. I was gonna say, um, I uh, had a, I, I think I disappeared myself there for a bit. My internet kind of, usually it's fine, but um, I live out in the woods. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully worry. I won't do anything crazy out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go through and show um, like my process for how I take my scans or my, you know, um, sometimes I'm super lazy, honestly, I'll just like, take a picture with my iPhone and then use that. Um, but how I take those, um, that from, you know, my, my scans or my image um, and bring it into my font design application and then actually start drawing an outline. So um, people have asked me this before, oh, what font program do you use? So I started with Font Lab and then I've worked quite a bit in Glyphs and now I work in kind of a combination of <laughs> all three different font lit, this is nuts. So um, so sometimes I still use the older version of Font Lab and sometimes I use Glyphs. 
And now like I've been kind of transitioning into um, Font Lab 6, but I'm pretty new to it. So I'm still sort of going back. It just, it just depends, you know, I mean, when you've used the same program for like, you know, several years, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to make a switch. And each one of these um, software programs does different things. I mean, they, you know, um, some people just, you know, it's like they, they get into glyphs and they find that it feels like second nature to them. And some people might jump into, you know, Font Lab or RoboFont or, you know, there's a ton of different options out there for software. And most of them have free demos that you can download and play with. And that's what I would recommend doing is um, seeing what feels, you know, kind of most natural to you. Because many of the the professional software, uh, font design software programs do the same things. It's the interface that changes. So, you know, it's really kind of a matter of like going for, you know, what, what works best for you. So, all right, let me share my screen here. Amazing. And right. have we got about, is five, 10 minutes enough for this section? Cause I'm really keen oh, to yeah. get to Q&A as well. Um, Cause we've got some amazing questions coming in. All right, can you see my W? Yes, yes, we can. All right, so typically I'll have maybe like an entire page of letters. Um, it's funny to see Debbie's sketches because mine look exactly the same. <laughs> like I, I'll yeah. scan in pages and pages and pages or, or you know, photograph pages and pages of lettering. But for example, I'll bring this, you know, this letter in here and I will lasso it. And it's just as simple as copying it. And then I go into Font Lab. And there is a new font window that I just brought up. And then I will paste this reference glyph. And then I will take my pen tool. Wow, so it's literally copy out. and paste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now there is a particular method of um, drawing outlines here that is worthy of mentioning. Um, there's been a little bit of debate about what the actual name of it is um, for the method of drawing. Uh, some people call like, you know, like logarithmic drawing, um, orthogonal drawing. I'm not really sure. but. Um, the point is, is that whenever you are drawing outlines like this, you want to be putting your nodes on the extremum in most cases, which is the outermost edge of a curve. And then you um, mm -hmm. also want to have your handlebars in most cases constrained at um, horizontal, vertical and um, uh, hor uh, vertical and horizontal axes. Sorry, it's hard to talk sometimes when you're drawing. So um, <laughs> it's like when you play guitar or something. You can't do both. Oh, totally. I'm yeah. So it's pretty funny when I'm when I'm drawing these outlines. I have this tendency to. Um, it's like I have my left hand. I'm right-handed, so I have my left hand on the keyboard, and I'm holding down the shift key. So it's kind of a click, shift, drag. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, oops. You look like you've done this before, Laura. Maybe a couple of times. Oh right? yeah. I know. It's it's like the pressure is on though. Like when you have people watching you, and you're like, eh, you know. <laughs> And then, of course, um, the first time around, you know, it's it never looks, you know, like perfect. Um, so, you know, you have to, uh, sorry, move the. So you have to go back and, you know, like make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. you now I can delete this um, reference image, and um, you know, make some make some little changes here to my my outlines. Um, there are some really good articles on my um, website that I have set up for. Um, uh, how to how to out how to draw proper outlines, and it's something that is it's important to, um, to learn how to do it because uh, it helps with um, how things are rendered on screen. But even more than that, it helps sort of give you the answers as to um, how to fix things, how to how to draw your outlines. You know, like where where do you put your nodes? How do you handle certain things? Um, once you learn that sort of scientific process, I guess you can say you will fly through um, these outlines, drawing these outlines. And uh, things will get a lot faster. So um, because you're not, uh, we, we've linked up your website just below this um, session, by the way. So for everyone yeah. watching, click through, and and there is an absolute just vault of information on Laura's website. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, James uh, Ed Edmondson has a really really amazing article that explains kind of the concept of this um, and you know how it's how it all works. But um, what I love about doing this is when I first learned how to do this is that it took all the guesswork out of drawing outlines when I learned how to draw them according to this particular method I'm talking about. Whereas you notice like my nodes are, you know, they're on the outermost edge called the extremum. And you notice that most of these handlebars are constrained to horizontal and vertical, even here, like to create this curve, you know, I have a horizontal, um, you know, these handlebars are horizontal, vertical, so on. And then of course there's some that break the rule, but you know, so there's my W and it looks like garbage, but 
<laughs> is pretty good for doing it pretty quickly. Um, it's very good. So, <laughs> yeah. So I'll show you real quickly. Um, uh, just uh, want to talk real quick about um, let's talk real quick about contextual alternates. I'm going to skip all over the place here. So contextual alternates are are super fun. Um, basically, uh, what a contextual alternate does is it changes um, any given letter in context. So it substitutes one letter when it shows up to another letter um, based on um, adjacency. So for example, watch what happens in the screen when I type contextual alternates out. This first screen right here will show you um, what the font looks like without the contextual alternate feature activated. And this screen down here will show you what it looks like when it is activated. So watch what happens when I type. You see how in this bottom screen, this font continues to change. These letters start substituting out. Yeah. And you can actually see the code here. So you can see like that's your standard C, that's your, so this O substituted to a different glyph here. The N subs made a substitution, the T did, the E did, the X stayed the same, the T changed, the U and the A stayed the same, the L, you know, and so, and so on and so forth. It's pretty amazing. And this is what contextual alternate programming looks like. And it looks a little bit scary, um, I think. I was gonna say, that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but it's actually really quite simple. So if I wanted to, um, let's see, if I wanted to just, you know, actually I'll type something, I'll type in a code right here. This is the, the basic uh, basis of it. So if I wanted to do a substitution, I would just say sub A by A dot zero one, for example. And I would, it basically kind of tells me, you know, when I, when you type in A, you substitute it by A dot zero one. So now with um, open type features, I'm kind of skipping all over here because I'm trying to condense this down for time. Um, oh, sorry, let's take a look here. Oh, here we go, yes. All of our features here, stylistic set 01, 02, contextual alternates, stylistic alternates, ligatures, whatever is in this panel right here relates to what you see when you go into say Adobe Illustrator and you start looking at the open type panel. So whatever I type in there will show up, um, you know, mm -hmm. over in this area right here. And so that's kind of how, you know, features are defined. Um, but you can really sort of put anything in there that you want. Um, so ligature, you know, whatever you have in ligature doesn't have to actually be a ligature. It could be something else entirely. But you can see with the feature ligature, you know, I defined the feature. So I said liga, which is the four letter code for ligature. And again, you can look that up. Um, you can just go to Google and type in open type features and it'll give you all these different four letter codes here. And I've said, Okay, so when the ligature feature is activated, substitute, and someone types in T, T, two T's in a row, say substitute T, T by T underscore T, which is the T underscore, let's see, which is this glyph right here. So now, I go here, I'm gonna compile this, and I'll type in my ligature. So now if I do T, T, you see what happens. It will sub make a substitution oh, for cool. me when feature is activated. So that's kind of the long and short of um, how open type features work. Um, so yeah, you can do quite a bit of different things with them. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, as you see with this contextual alternates, I don't know if I showed you, I showed you that one. It's um, a lot of substitutions and a lot of uh, things can happen. And that's something that's really critical, I think, especially when you're working with a script font to get really that natural sort of look to it that, you know, better script joining behavior, um, you know, random you know, random letters introduced so that you're not, you know, coming up with when you type in the word banana, you know, you yeah. uh, have different, you know, looking A's, as you can see, you know, there's a couple that are a little bit different here, you know, this one at the end, mm -hmm. there we go. You can see different things start to happen. So, so there we go. And I will turn it on back to you over back to you here. And I just put a note in chat that um, Laura and I are considering a um, font making course, an online course. So anyone who's possibly interested can just send me a DM on Instagram and we'll add you to the interested list. And it won't be for a while, but um, we're, we're talking about it now. So yeah, trying to figure and out a lot of things around it. So yeah, it, yeah it's, well, it's like such a, such a comprehensive <laughs> topic, isn't it, Laura? And Debbie, like it's um, yeah, there, there's so much to it. And I think what's so helpful about today is I want people who are on the fence about should I explore font design to actually get that insight and then go and learn it. Because it's definitely not something you can learn um, comprehensively in an hour, no. far from it. But <laughs> um, you might have no idea how to make a font. And I'm sure a lot of the hundreds of people with us today 
don't perhaps know that. And so I think this is a really great insight in just to how the process works from experienced professionals, like some of the technicalities and the software you're going to use. I think that um, overview for the right people is, is really going to inspire them. And maybe some people look at it and they're like, oh, no, I can never make a font. It's too complex. <laughs> but I think uh, I think for the characters out there, um, yeah, we're going to see some amazing fonts on the back of all of this. So definitely we're, we're going to um, let you know where you can reach out to these guys after this session. Have um, you got a little bit more time? Because I'd love to jump into yeah, Q&A right now. Absolutely. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Let's yeah. let's give it up for Laura and Debbie in the comments, guys. As uh, Jay says, this is fascinating, Laura. Thanks so much. Hannah says, love learning about all this open type stuff. Fascinating. It is very clever. I feel like it's evolved so much as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Jen, first question um, asks, what do you recommend as starter font design software? So um, perhaps what we just looked at is a bit more on the advanced side. But if you're just starting out, what, what would your go to be? I like Glyphs. I mean, I think that like Glyphs Mini is a is a great way to go. Um, I think Font Lab also has a um, introductory um, uh, software program as well. But there's some others like Font Creator and um, yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a ton of good choices. When I was getting started, there was hardly anything to choose from. I mean, it was like there was two or three programs out there, and you know, like you didn't really have. A lot of options. Now there's a lot of choices. Um, I really think it really comes down to downloading demos and playing with them and seeing what interface you like best because it's such an individual choice. Yeah. Somebody mentioned Type Tool by Font Lab. Oh, and yeah, that, yeah. that is a really good starter um, for uh, for beginners. And I think it, everything that somebody you know, said, it's, it feels like it's overwhelming and might, might be over your head. Um, I'm 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 new to technology. I will tell you, or I was new to technology when I first started. I'm not ashamed to say I was 53 when I first started designing fonts. Okay, so if I can do it, <laughs> trust me. You can do it. But it is it is a matter of really just um, taking the time to understand that it's a long process, and there's a lot of different parts to it. But um, Laura is an incredible teacher, and that's why I'm really um, excited that we we are having the poss discussing the possibility possibility of doing an online course because she just is so knowledgeable and she's so great about how she shares that information. So she can break things down so that step by step anyone can learn it. But you have to really want to want to do it. You have to have a love for letters and a love for what it, what it could be. Um, in the hands of someone who who is a great designer, or you know anyone who designs and uses fonts, you just you just have to really want to know what that person would like to use it for, and that that it has to start there. Yeah, I completely agree, and just that love for learning will um, really serve you well. I think. Yeah. Uh, so we've got another question from Sara, who says, "How do you connect brush lettering or calligraphic typefaces as seamlessly as possible?" Oh, yes. Um, we ran out of time for that, but that's totally okay because a couple of years ago, I did a font um, I did a font connection or script connection, connecting scripts webinar for Font Lab. <laughs> and oh, I think uh, Raluca has the, um, the link to that. It's on YouTube and it's pretty lengthy. It's like um, I sit there and talk about it for like an hour and a half and I go into great detail. <laughs> okay, so go it. watch that, guys. Yeah, this is something you want to learn properly instead of like a 10 second answer. So that sounds like a perfect resource. Thank you for sharing. Yes, yes. Awesome. Um, also, we've got a question from James um, who says, how lucrative is creating your own fonts? And I guess the answer is that can vary massively. Like any product, there's people making zero wow. and there's people making a fortune. But just to give an idea for like what people's expectations could be if they do it well, I guess. Wow. You know, you can... Yeah, it's so all over the map. I mean, I, I have some typefaces that I've designed that were just complete and total duds. I mean, that, you know, I, I probably in my lifetime will never recoup the money, you know, like as far as how much time the I time, put into yeah. it. And then others <laughs> that have done amazingly well and that I could, you know, like live off of, you know, just say like my Samantha script font, you know, um, alone. Um, so it is just all over the map. I mean, it's, 
I wish I could give it. I mean, people do make a living as type design. You can make a living absolutely as a type designer. Um, I do think though that it's one of those things that if, if that's, it, it, you almost have to kind of do it, like focus on that as your exclusive career. If you're going to, you know, if you want to make a living, you know, it's not something necessarily that you could do part time because you sort of have to um, yeah. publishing like pretty regularly and keeping up with an audience. And um, some people get lucky and they, you know, publish one or two typefaces and they make a ton of money off of it. And then they, they never need to worry about it again. So, you know, you know, they don't need to do anything more. But for me, um, in the beginning, I remember um, it was it felt like a hamster wheel like I was on, like this rat race, you know, of like publishing, publishing, publishing. And I would notice that if I went for more than two or, you know, a couple of months without publishing something, my sales would just plummet. And then I'd have to get something, you know, hurry and get something out there. And then, you know, as several years passed, it's like, I don't have to worry so much about like that constant, you know, like I got to get, you know, a new design yeah. out there. Um, Cause you got that catalog. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I will say is, and you know, this is Tom, this is right up your whole alley of marketing, but it's true. 20% of the time is spent working on the font, which is a lot. It's a lot of time to create a really well thought out font. 80% of the time, should be spent marketing because if you if no one knows about it then it could be the most beautiful font in the world and if no one knows about it it's not going to sell and there are a lot of fonts out there that sell very well because the person does a really great job of marketing so it's how much work you want to put into the marketing part because that that just mm -hmm. is a part of the business you know it, it'd be lovely yeah wasn't but it is <laughs> so just know that yeah. and you know and then uh you'll you'll be, you'll be fine if you understand that and um and take advantage of that absolutely and um obviously we see a lot of fonts and we're the most curated design marketplace so we have to say no to a lot of fonts we're lucky enough to work with talented people like you guys and say yes to some of the best fonts out there there's a huge disparity and i think some people they enter this world and they're churning out like one font a week and you just know the quality is not going to be there it looks rushed it, it's not as robust it's not as refined at all um and when we actually started working with you laura you spend months on some of your fonts, I believe. Oh, yeah. And it was a real insight. It was like, okay, here's someone who's really taking this seriously. And and I think it really shows and it gives your fonts more longevity in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It can take, um, you know, I remember like in particular, I think Samantha script was six months solid of working on nothing but that, like literally nothing but that typeface. I had wow. no other projects I had nothing else going on. Um, and it was a little torturous <laughs> towards the end there. It was like, when is the thing going to end? You know? <laughs> Um, it gets a little, you know, it gets a little tiresome. I, you know, you really have to have a lot of patience, I think, you know, to really work on it. But, um, you know, it ends up paying off. And, you know, you want to wait until like you get it, you know, you get it just right before, you know, you, you know, send it to market. Because, I mean, once it's out there, I mean, it's, it's out there. You can't really do a whole lot to change it. So, you know, <laughs> take your time with it for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, we've got a question from Justin saying, what letters do you start with first? Jonathan Hoffler mentioned in the latest documentary uh, abstract on Netflix that he starts with H and O. He mentions that typically nobody starts with these letters because they're boring, but said that they actually define the majority uh, of the time if the system will work. So curious to know what letters you start with. Yeah. So, I mean, it's different, I believe, with when I when I think about the type, you know, uh, typography, you know, typography, I think of it as being split into two different camps. You have text type and display type. So text is in, most people will say like serif and sans serif. Text typefaces are primarily meant for um, functionality. You know, it's, um, and um, whereas, you know, script and display faces are primarily meant for form, you know. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you start with things that are different, letters that are different for uh, script typeface or display faces than you would a text face. Um, so uh, uh, for me, yeah, I, I don't really start with any particular letters. I, you know, like we'll really focus on, say, like the lowercase alphabet. But um, I really like to, you know, like nail down certain things, so like, uh, you know, the letters that are going to be used most frequently, like um, E-T-A-O-I-N-S and uh, some of the others. But how about you, Debbie? Oh, she. 
No, that's all right. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm doing something encouraging. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I'm mo mostly focused on is the connection. And so um, if you watch the video that Laura does of showing the R's connecting, I probably start, I, I, I do all of the letters first, all the lowercase letters and the uppercase letters, just the basic ones. And I put them in and I actually do something like this where I print them, I do a little printout and then I start to look at, you know, where problems might be. But as far as connections, I start with the R. And I, and you know the um, that's the, a tough one, right? And the answer: if you can get your R right, you can pretty much make uh, all of the lowercase letters work. So uh, that's that's where I start. And I know you you also kind of do that too, Laura. In I general, do. You, you start with the R too, because you know she taught me everything I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, guys, I, I wish we could chat all day and we've got a few more fantastic questions, but I'm going to highly encourage everyone to reach out to you guys. You've got a ton of great content online. We've linked up Laura's website, but you're both just fountains of knowledge when it comes to this stuff. So where is the best place for people to find you? And then after revealing that, we're going to run a very quick contest as well as a surprise to cap off Tuesday. Okay. So I'm going to put in my... Um Instagram and my website. Amazing. And they're, they're both Debbie Sementelli, right? Yes. So make it easy. Incredible. Awesome. So that's just in the chat. That's debbiesementelli.com and at Debbie Sementelli on Instagram. How about you, Laura? So I'm going to put in my place? website um, where I have just a, I have a ton of information on there. I've got, um, articles that have really, really lengthy articles I spent quite a bit of time on earlier this year with um, links to resources and um, videos. Um, I have quite a few video clips on my YouTube uh, page. Um, Instagram and Facebook are really, yeah, I would say those those places. So YouTube, Amazing. Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. yeah. I'm, Love also, that. I'm also on YouTube. Everywhere. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Um, and as I mentioned, guys, thank you for being here live today. And as a special treat, we've got a mini contest, which involves both Laura and Debbie very generously giving away some of their fonts, some of their premium fonts to you guys. So do you guys mind sharing a couple of details about that, please? Oh, sure. Go ahead, Debbie. Okay. Well, you're going to determine who wins, right? Uh, we we all can. I'm gonna. I'll share details okay. on that in a moment. Yeah. So, yeah. What what are yeah? What are we giving away, guys, in terms of fonts? Oh, that's what I thought. I'm typing it. Oh, you're I'm typing it. Six licenses for personal use. Well, they can be for professional use as well. Six yep. licenses of my soon to be released font which is the example of what I um, was using. With, with the invitations. And yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Hello, My Love. And it looks beautiful. I can't wait to see it. So this is going to be a fresh front. It's going to be all over DC in the near future. I predict you're going to be seeing it on our homepage under the most popular. Um, this is a chance for six of you to win a license to this brand new font. And also, Laura, you've lined up a fantastic prize as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I, I decided I'd give away my uh, charcuterie collection. I wish I could pronounce that properly, but alas, I am not French. And <laughs> I said like that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I, I just thought it'd be perfect for um, the upcoming holidays. It's uh, kind of a, got a lot of cute little accents and, you know, traits in it for that. Um, if mm. someone wins it and they've already, they already have shark, yeah, that one, then I'll be happy to substitute it for something different. So um, yeah, that's what I'm going to be giving away. Amazing. Very kind. And I believe shark future is $79 or something. So it is yeah. definitely worth it's getting a hands on guys. <laughs> it's, it's a stunning font family. So um, two incredible font families up for grabs. The way to enter and our team will put this in the chat is to head over to our Facebook group. And we're going to be setting up a thread there very imminently, which is asking one simple question. What was the biggest takeaway that you got from this session? 
What's the most useful thing you took away from this session? Let us know in the comments right there in the Facebook group. We're going to put the group up in just a few minutes and leave a comment with the um, <clears throat> with the most useful part of this session. We're going to pick winners at random. So it's going to be seven winners, six for Hello My Love, one for Charcuterie, and we hope that you love working with the fonts. And you guys have been fantastic. Thank you for being so active. I, I'm yeah. noting a lot of inspired people who I think are going to yeah. start making fonts in the comments. And it was great as well to see a few people who um, were a little bit older than um, perhaps the average people starting out in the font industry, but they're feeling really inspired and saying, why not start now? And absolutely, why not? There should be absolutely no age restrictions on any of this. It's just your creativity. And so... I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Thanks for having us. It's been fun. Thanks to everyone for watching and participating for the great questions. And good luck on winning. Yeah, yeah good luck, everyone. Debbie and Laura, thank you so, so much for today. That thank was you. Yeah. I'm going to hang out with some questions here. And so, yeah, <laughs> thanks so much. Perfect. Um, thanks again, guys. And thank you, everyone who's joined live. Be sure to head on over as well to our speakers page for our birthday. We have a ton more speakers happening. We've got three more tomorrow, three more on Thursday, covering topics like illustration, like earning more money as a creative. Some real pillars of knowledge are gonna be dropped over the next couple of days, and we hope that you love it. As well, of course, grab our bundles. Our best bundles from the last six years are all available right now for up to 99% off some of the best resources out there. And of course, there's also our birthday competition where you can win an iPad Pro and freebies. You can tell we've got all kinds of stuff going on, guys. It's just endless birthday celebrations. So if you go to Design Cuts, you can click around, discover all of this awesomeness. But once again, Debbie, Laura, thank you so much. I will chat to you both soon, no doubt. Um, Debbie, do you, do you want to show off the T-shirt? Oh, yeah. Just, uh, if uh, anyone can see it. We got Design Cuts t shirt. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Perfect. Have a fantastic rest of your day, everyone. And Thanks. we'll see you back here tomorrow. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 <laughs>